Hello guys, this is the Betamax fan here. Um, this is an SL100. Um, this was supposed to be an SLHF450. Um, and he sent me this one. And apparently they both had the same problem because there's no power light. The guy said, oh, there's something wrong with the power supply. Well, yeah, there is. That's, it's got a voltage regulator problem. No power light. STK5441. The voltage regulator is messed up in this one as well. He was sent me, he was supposed to send me the 450. He didn't. He sent me an SL100. And I'm a little irritated at him because he charged me 80 some dollars to have it shipped and then I paid an additional 60 dollars because of what it was you know uh, the 450 is, is a lot nicer machine and uh, it's a more higher end unit and the 450 is a 3 head versus a uh, 2 head this is the SL 100 which is a, a 2 head model but it's a plain Jane model, so I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk to him, but uh, you know what? I guess it doesn't really matter because it's something that I could restore, something to work on, something we could fix. So I'm gonna take the top off. I took the screws out, and the guy has a uh, tape stuck inside so so the uh, voltage uh, regulator I see uh, is what's failed on this one and uh, it looks like maybe they were playing a videotape in it and some kind of power surge happened and and blew out the regulator uh, these uh, voltage regulators this is the regulator this black uh, chip right here where my finger is this black chip that's a uh, SDK 5441 it is a Sanyo made product the uh, chip is I mean this is a Sony machine but the chip is made by Sanyo so Sanyo made the voltage regulators for Sony so we can get the tape out by um, we're gonna move the we're gonna move this for move this forward and as you can see it's gonna unthread the tape so this is how to get a tape out if you, you've got a stuck tape in a uh, Sony Betamax uh, 711 B chassis so if you have the 711 B chassis this is how you can remove the tape and I'll show you how so we're gonna unthread it this is how it it loads Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll pull it out. Okay, now we have to transfer to the other gear. This transfers power to the other gear. So, by holding that, now this is going to take forever to do it this way. Oh, it might be that way, yeah. I think it's this way. Okay, yeah, it's starting to come up. I'm just trying to show you on camera, but I'm going to hold it with one hand, and the other hand I'm going to use the tooth belt. I'm going to pull the tooth belt to get it so it'll eject. So let me do that, and we'll get the tape out. Okay, so I got the tape out, so there's the tape. I just cleaned it with some alcohol to uh, get rid of the coronavirus. If there is coronavirus on on the deck. Anyway, disinfected it. So, here's what we got going on. We got to pull. I had to pull the circuit board and move it off to the side to get it out the tape out because the belt had come off of the track and I had to reinsert the belt and take it out however I still got to do that anyway because I'm going to pull that power supply 
So I've never pulled a power supply on an SL100 before. So this will be the first time, but um, I believe that there's going to be one, two, three, probably about five, six screws. There's a screw there and there, so we'll pull it out. So I'm going to unplug it, and uh, we're going to pull the power supply out, and I'll show you uh, what, uh, I'll show you my new part, because I actually have, uh, well, I had two of the STK5441s. Uh, I used one already, and I'm on my last voltage regulator, so I need to order a couple more. I like to have at least one or two on hand, because I see this problem with a lot of the Sony Beta machines. I see this problem quite often. So it's it's good for me to keep the parts, keep myself in stock with parts that I need. So let's uh, pull that power supply out and uh, let's get that uh, regulator out of there and uh, we'll put a new one in. And then uh, we'll see if there's any other issues that it, that it may have. So I've got the power supply pulled apart. This is the voltage regulator I see right here. This is the chip that we need to take out. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut the old one off. We're going to cut it off. That way when I unsolder the pins, they'll pull out easy. Uh, this is just for me because I use a uh, solder sucker pump. Um, I found the best way for me to remove these things is to just take my diagonal pliers and cut the old one off at the leads. And then uh, when I heat the leads, I'll use my sucker and take as much solder off of those pins as I can. And uh, if I need to, I could just heat, heat it up and pull the pin right out. And I can do it one by one. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to cut the old one off. And I will get my iron nice and hot. And we'll get this thing all taken care of. Now there's a lot of um, Elna capacitors. Um, Elna capacitors, they always seem to go bad. I always have a problem with the Elna capacitors. Uh, the Nichicons are really good. Um, uh, Rubicons are okay. Uh, Sanyo caps were were not that great either. So I just I'm I like Nichicon. I like Rubicon. Um, there's a couple other ones that I like, you know. But uh, there's even some of the cheaper branded uh, caps. I just seem to always have problems with the uh, Elna capacitors, and uh, the Elna caps are usually this kind of this dark, darkish, bluish green, you know, color to them. But anyway, um, the only thing that we have that's failed is the regulator. At least so far, that's what I know is that the regulator is definitely bad. And if you check the voltages, you'll notice that on um, some of the pins where, you know, the voltage isn't there. On, you know, because there's like 9 volt, uh, 5 volt, uh, there's a 12, you know, so the regulator is definitely bad. So let's get it out and... Uh, I'll get my uh, soldering iron heated up and we'll put a new one in. So here's the old one. So I just simply cut it off at the at the leads. I just kind of nipped them. Nipped it at the leads and just kind of nipped them off. So now I can get my iron hot and I can start desoldering 
all these connections. Now, for this kind of work, I recommend using a very fine tip on your soldering iron. Use a very fine small tip because these are are uh, these joints are very very close together. And uh, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to put too much solder on there because if you put too much solder, what's going to happen is it's going to solder next to the the two pins are going to get soldered together instead of separately. So I just wanted to point that out. So let's get our we're going to get our new one out here in just a minute. Let me get this uh, this stuff all these pins taken out once they're out. Uh, we'll put the new one in. So here is the new uh, chip that we're going to install. Now what you'll need is some uh, thermal grease. You'll need some thermal grease because we got to put it. Our heat sink compound is another word for it. You put a little bit on the back there. And you can see where the new one mounts where it mounts and that's where it mounts so it has to have a little bit of the grease right there you know so what we'll, we'll, we'll show you once we get the chip soldered in so here's what i've done is i've heated up the pins and then i pulled them out so what i might need to do is take my solder sucker and suck some of the solder away because I don't know if I've got the pins will probably still go down in there I may not have to remove any of the solder because uh, well I will that one I can see I need to remove some of the solder but I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing all uh, put in here the trick uh, is to line up all the pins into the hole and they're they're all done i've got a couple pins here on the end that are boogered up a little bit but uh, i should be able to get it in once you slide it into the holes then i like to bend the pins on each side uh, so that the chip will stay in there while i'm soldering it in so let's get that soldered in and uh, get it put back together now there's wires that actually connect to this circuit board. They don't unplug. They will unplug from the board here, but I didn't want to go through all that. I just wanted to do it the easiest way possible. And this is the easiest way. So now my next challenge is to get all the pins lined up and uh, we'll get it all soldered in. And uh, this thing should uh, fire right up. Okay, so I've uh, soldered one pin in. I was having some trouble with uh, uh, one of the pins. And I finally got it to go into the hole. And I've, uh, I've installed all half a dozen of these chips. So it's a pretty common procedure for the uh, the uh, Sony 711B uh, chassis. So I'm going to show you me uh, soldering it in and I'll try to try to give you the best view I can. Um, I don't have a tripod so I can't shine down at what I'm doing but I will try and uh, get you the best view possible so I think uh, this is going to be probably the best best of view that I'm going to be able to give you so I'm just going to tack this in here
Okay. There we go. Okay, we're all soldered in now. So now we can start uh, getting the uh, power supply back in. And I'll show you here uh, the half decent uh, solder job here. So there we go. It's uh, half halfway decent. I, I'd say I did okay. So <laughs> I'm checking to see if there's any um, in dry joints. I just when I'm soldering, I'm always making sure that I get the solder melted all the way around evenly. And so it looks like I'm doing pretty good. I think my solder job is pretty decent. So, okay, let's get this thing uh, back together. And uh, what we'll do is we've got to clean. So we've got to clean the uh, where the the chip was. I'm gonna clean this whole area, and uh, we'll put some new uh, thermal grease. And we'll just apply it to the back of the chip, and I'll spread it out with a uh, um, Q-tip, and then uh, we'll be good. So, uh, and then we'll we'll see if uh, if it has any other issues that may need to be addressed. So, okay, okay, we've got a nice little. Uh, coating of uh, heat sink compound or thermal grease what you might want to call it so we'll start getting this uh, power supply put back together and then we'll we'll fire up the unit well we uh, we have a power light now so that's good um, but it keeps wanting to load a cassette so there's something going on with the uh, cassette housing so and then you can't turn it back on so there's something that's jamming so I'm gonna unplug it because I don't want to get it to uh, I don't want the thing to get jammed all jammed up so I think that there's definitely something wrong with the cassette uh, housing because it wants to uh, that switch it wants to automatically load a cassette and there's something going on with this cassette basket because it's not wanting to it's got a power light, so we have power, but there's also something else that's going on here, too. So, this machine is just not going to make it easy on me, is it? Because it wants to, it wants to load... It's kind of in a in a in a bind is what's happening, so the switch is malfunctioning is what's going on. There is a a, a switch is being pressed. So we gotta take the cassette housing out and find out what's going on with that. But I don't think I'm going to do it all tonight. I'll do it in stages. At least we've got the power supply voltage regulator. We've got the new one installed and it's working. So the power supply is working, but it's getting jammed up. So there might be some capacitors that have failed 
on this as well because that power supply might have but the switch for the there we go the switch for the cassette basket is right there so we'll unplug that and let's plug it back in See? There we go. Now it's behaving like it should. Okay. We've also got a stuck solenoid. Our solenoid is sticking on us. Okay, so we've got the power supply working. Um, there's nothing wrong with the power supply. This is all cassette basket related. Also, cassette housing actually is the proper term. We have an issue with the switch, and I think the switch is being pressed. So we might have to take... So let me plug this... Um, let's get a tape that we can use. I've got a tape somewhere around here. Here we go, we we'll use this one. Okay. Alright, we're gonna we're gonna put I'm gonna put okay, there we go. Yep, there's something wrong with the cassette basket. Also, one of the, the mounting tabs is broken. This mounting tab is broken. So that that's going to be something we're going to have to figure out what to do with that. Because I'll probably have to put a screw through there. A screw to uh, hold that in place I don't know because the it's not the tab itself that's broke it's the um, mounting hardware that the tab that the tab slides over so, let's just put our let's see what happens if we put the switch back on See what happened there? She's playing. Oh, where's my counter? She's playing. Yeah, this is uh, lubrication. That is lubrication related. No, nope, wants to go in again.
Okay, I'm gonna hook and hook this up to the monitor, and we'll see if uh, we have a picture. All right. We have a picture. We have a picture. Okay, it's picture, not picture. Sorry. Now I'm gonna go like this and like that. I don't want no copyright. Woo, woo, woo. Oh wait, okay, sorry. Okay, so we'll go like that. That way we don't get hit with copyright claim. And we are playing. Let's fast forward. Let's rewind. Okay. So I think what's going on with the cassette housing is I think the lubrication has dried up in it. So let's eject it. Okay, so the lubrication is probably dried up, but I think the switch is sticking. That switch is sticking, and so it's telling the machine that there's been a tape inserted when there's no tape. So we're going to address this issue. Um in in part two and uh so look for part two because this will be part one so part one we got the power supply issue fixed we put a new voltage regulator i see in so we just have a problem with the cassette basket and the clock display is very very dim uh it's actually not on camera it looks okay but in real life this is kind of dim and that's usually because sometimes it could be the uh, fluorescent display is just wearing out it's pooping out or capacitors in the power supply that control the clock the caps are starting to die because you can have a capacitor that's completely open if a cap is open completely that means the capacitor has completely went out then there's capacitors that are starting to go out and then you have you know so we might have you know I might need to just order some caps get some caps ordered and uh, maybe just recap the uh, power supply and see if that will restore our clock display because sometimes I've found that replacing the caps in the power supply will restore the brightness of the uh, clock display because you're not getting enough the voltage is there but it's not running 100% and it's got a dim display so part two we will take a look at the cassette housing so in order to pull the cassette housing out we just need to take four screws out uh, then we have to unplug the connector which is over here 
and uh, disconnect the belt and she'll pop right out and then we can take a look at the uh, cassette housing and, and we'll take a look at the switch too because there's something wrong with the cassette housing because it's pressing the switch the switch thinks that a tape has been inserted so that's what's going on but this thing is very very dusty very dirty so that's going to be it on this video for today and uh, maybe tomorrow we'll or maybe Saturday we'll take a look at the cassette housing and we'll see if we can get that fixed now I'm thinking the lubrication has dried up and is causing the gears not to move like they should if you'd be amazed at at uh, what kind of problems you can have with just old dried up lubricants because lubricant the grease doesn't last forever so eventually grease goes bad and it can you know grease could go for you know 10 plus years and not have a problem and then all of a sudden it starts drying out and parts start to stick so I do have another cassette housing if I need another cassette basket I can put one in but I think this one's just gonna need some lubrication done to it and I think this cassette basket is going to be savable so this was this has kind of been fun to uh, work on I haven't put a regulator in, in a little while quite a while so but new the new regulator is in and uh, is doing its job We'll see you in the next video, and we'll see you in uh, part two. We'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to hit that uh, like and uh, subscribe button, and ring that bell for uh, new uh, videos that will be coming up. Now we're gonna order. I'm gonna order a few more machines. Um, I want to pick up at least uh, two or three more machines and sometimes it takes two weeks to get to me um, a lot of times beta machines they seem to be in the you know like two three thousand miles away you know so it, it just seems to work out that way that a lot of the beta players that are listing for sale are from like Arizona. I live in, in Oregon, and the ones I'm seeing is like Arizona or um, uh, Colorado, or, you know, like quite a ways away. So it takes a couple weeks for these machines to get to me. Now, I was wanting the 450, I was supposed to have the SL450, but that didn't happen so he sent me this instead so I'm just going to accept this and not uh, I'm not going to say anything because uh, most likely he won't do anything for me anyway so even though he shipped the wrong unit most people don't have two Betamaxes for sale so anyway um, it does bug me that I paid more See, if I would have known that I wasn't going to get the 450, I wouldn't have paid the price I had to pay. I ended up paying around $130. There's no way I would pay $130 including shipping for SL100. Because these machines are just not worth that kind of money. The 450 is actually one of the uh, three head units. Uh, because it's got the slow motion, the perfect pause, all kinds of stuff. So I was, I was disappointed when I got this one. But it's okay because I can still make a profit on it. 
it's going to be a very small profit but at least I'll be making something off of it and I'll have more machines coming in I've got a couple of VHS machines that are coming in although I'm not that interested in VHS machines and I don't know the VHS's like I do the betas I know betas very very well VHS is not so much so see you in the next one bye bye so uh before we leave I thought I would crack one of these open and show you what's inside these I never looked inside of one so I thought it'd be interesting to show what's inside these things. Looks like just a big old circuit board with a couple of... Uh, I'm not sure what components those are. They look like they might be a couple of transistors. But I could be wrong, but they kind of look like a transistor, but they may not be because they don't have, transistors have three uh, prongs, and they might, I'm not sure what kind of chip that is. Um, oh, they might, might be... Uh, Yeah, actually, I don't know what they are. I don't think they're capacitors, but they may be. I, I doubt that's what they are, but they look like... They do look like a transistor. Except for they don't have three leads, they just have two. So I thought that was very interesting to see what's inside of one of these. And then, of course, you got your your leads coming out. So, I just thought we'd take a look at it. Pop it open and, and uh, see well, what's inside of one. But there's not much there. There's really not much there. Definitely a big old circuit board with some components. Anyway, see you later.